All right, so, uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, how a typical engine works. So most of the small airplanes that we train in have just a regular piston internal combustion gasoline engine just like you find in the car pretty much. Um, most of the engines that we use are uh, what they call horizontally opposed. In the automotive world, they call that a boxer engine. So Subaru. Uh, Subaru. They're the uh, big ones. Volkswagen. The older Volkswagen engines, in fact, here in figure 7-2, they show a horizontally opposed engine, and this engine that they show in figure 7-2 is actually a Volkswagen. So Those things last forever. Yep, yeah. So those are very popular on home-built aircraft because they're very similar to other certified aircraft engines, but it, they used that as an example of an opposed engine. We also have in 7-1 a radial engine. Those are cool engines. Those are what you find on stuff like Warbirds or... And they sound old, the coolest. Oh yeah, they sound <laughs> they, great. They have music, they but, have make uh, music very well. They don't, uh, they don't use those on airplanes very much anymore. But, uh, so, the piston engines that we use in airplanes are primarily uh, gasoline engines, four-stroke gasoline engines, just like you'd find in a car. So the four strokes that they're talking about, well, you hear this a lot, you know, four-stroke versus two-stroke versus you know, maybe a diesel or something. Uh, but a lot of people know those terms, but may not know exactly what we're referring to. So the four strokes that we're referring to are the four up and down movements of the piston within this engine cylinder. So initially, um, and a good, uh, they have a, a diagram of a two stroke here on figure seven dash three, but primarily, in airplanes, we're going to be de certified airplanes at least, uh, airplanes like the Chief or Cessnas, Pipers, things that you would find uh, as typical trainers, we're going to be dealing with four-stroke engines. So here in 7-5, on page 7-4, we have the four strokes of a four-stroke engine. So you start out with the cylinder at the top, the intake valve opens, the cylinder goes down, it draws air in, the intake valve closes, uh, then the, the piston goes up in the cylinder, that compresses the air, raises its pressure very high and also somewhat raises its temperature, and uh, that air that it will have drawn in will be typically mixed with fuel. So now you've got a fuel-air mixture that's under high pressure. Well, uh, you've just made yourself a very potent mixture. Little bomb. <laughs> Essentially, yep. So then we have a spark plug at the top of the cylinder and that makes a little electric spark and ignites the fuel. As the fuel burns, it causes the air to expand uh, rather rapidly and by rather a lot. And that will push the, the piston back downwards in the cylinder and that's what creates the rotation that powers the engine. Now you've got the piston at the bottom of its stroke, uh, but you've got a whole bunch of exhaust fumes so the exhaust valve opens, piston goes back up and expels the uh, exhaust and you start the cycle over again. So we, t we uh, sometimes refer to these four strokes. Uh, the official uh, names, you have the intake stroke. So that's where the uh, piston goes down, draws air in. Compression is where it goes back up again and compresses that fuel-air mixture. We have the power stroke where the piston comes back down again and drives the engine, and then we have the exhaust stroke where it goes back up and expels that exhaust fumes from the cylinder. Uh, some people like to refer to that as suck, squeeze, bang, blow. <laughs> Not touching that. <laughs> but that's a, that's a, a, uh, That's a pretty, it sums it up. Yep. Uh, so that's what you have in each going on in each cylinder. Typically, the engines that we'll find in light training aircraft are four cylinders. So you have four of these cylinders, four of these pistons, all going. Uh, since it's arranged horizontally, it'll be going in and out all at the same time. And while one's on a compression stroke, another one's on an exhaust, and they're another all another one's on a power. They're all cylinder. time, so there's always one cylinder firing. Exactly, and that keeps the engine turning over Correct. nice and smooth. Um, if you get the timing off, it runs like crap, right? <laughs> yep, it sure does. Um, so then, uh, typically also in the uh, engines that we find in light training aircraft, and this is a little bit different from what you'd find in a car, for example, these are just direct drive engines. So rather than going into a gearbox a or a transmission that you'd find in a car, 
uh, the engine is just hooked straight onto the propeller. So the engine spins, it spins the propeller. We talked a little bit about propellers last time, and mm -hmm. the spinning of the propeller creates thrust. Um, now so we, when we see 2100 RPM on our tack from our flying lesson, right. that's exactly how fast the prop's going. That's how There's fast. No gearing whatsoever. That's correct. That's how fast okay. the engine's going, and that's the, also the same speed the prop is going because they're just bolted one to the other. Um, the other uh, thing to talk about is uh, a couple different kinds of propellers. Uh, the Chief and most light training airplanes have uh, what's called a fixed pitch propeller. It's just basically a big hunk of aluminum or wood or fiberglass or whatever kind of material that they've chosen to make propeller out of shaped into a propeller shape. That's you know about as simple as it gets. Uh, you can also have uh, adjustable pitch propellers, either uh, constant speed, which gets into a, a fairly complicated uh, mechanism for trying to, it's, esen it's essentially like a uh, automatic transmission on a car where it'll try to maintain the same engine speed by varying essentially how much bite the uh, propeller is taking out of the air. Uh, very much like uh, what you'd find on like a, a CVT, constantly variable transmission in like a Subaru or something. Mm -hmm. Sort of sort of uh, the same effect. Obviously the, me the mechanism is very different, but as far as the effect that you... The concept. The concept of how it transmits power, it's kind of similar. Um, you have... Uh, just straight uh, adjustable pitch propellers where you just have a control that directly adjusts the pitch of the propeller, that would be basically like a manual transmission in a car. Um, you but can, you can't do it while you're flying, correct? You do it on the ground. Uh, that's another type. So you can, you can have adjustable pitch propellers that you can just directly adjust while you're flying. Those are pretty rare. Okay. Uh, mostly they use constant speed, which is kind of like an automatic transmission. Right, because I remember seeing a Flying Cowboys video where the dude was taking he had this little gauge out and he was yep. adding a little more pitch to his propeller right. for where he was going or so that's, for what he wanted right so that's getting into that's a, called a ground adjustable propeller right and that's okay. what you're describing where you can set it on the ground you're essentially setting whether you want it to be optimized for a lower speed or a higher speed and propellers that are optimized for a lower speed uh i'm talking about the speed of the airplane here uh, not the speed of the propeller uh but if your propeller is optimized for the lower speed of the airplane, that's called a, a climb prop because typically it'll create more thrust uh, from a standstill. So it's like starting in a lower gear, but just like a, it's basically like a fixed gear bicycle uh, where you're, you know, you start out and if you have a low gear on your bicycle, then you can start out quickly, but pretty soon you're feet are going around about as fast as they can, you can't go any faster. Yep. And if you go the other way, where you're... It takes you, you a little more to start right, out. You, have, you, you can't get a very fast start because you have to push so hard, but once you do get going, you can go faster. And so that would be like a, uh, a climb prop would be like the low gear. So you get, you get going fast, you get off the ground that fast. That would be a flatter pitch, correct? Flatter pitch, correct. So the, the cruising, the one to go fast would have more pitch because it's getting more bite, more but it's bite harder on. to turn it around. Exactly. Okay. So yep. that uh, if you have a climb prop, it's better for takeoff and climb. Obviously, if you have a, what they call a cruise prop with more pitch, that's better for Might cruising. take you a little longer to get up to speed on the ground. Right. And... Uh, you can have different uh, kinds, for different uh, pitches of propellers on an airplane. Um, you can sw uh, swap out a propeller, or a mechanic can, a certified mechanic can swap out the propeller if you want to go from, say, a, a, a cruise prop to a climb prop, or vice versa. Um, those can be replaced. What does the Chief have on it? Uh, it's pretty much a climb prop. Uh, the Chief. Uh, because it has so many struts and wires, and it's never going to go... It's got a lot of drag on it. got a lot of drag. It's, it's, it's never going to go very fast anyway, so a cruise prop would kind of be a waste. So it's pretty much a climb prop. Just was curious when I was yeah. reading about it. I, just, yeah. I kind of figured that, but I And just also, uh, a climb prop is going to give you a better climb rate uh, on the same horsepower or allow you to have less horsepower for the same climb rate. So since we have a fairly small engine on the Chief, only 65 horsepower we kind of need that climb prop just to get off the ground. Uh, talking about uh, the engine though, uh, 
Um, we talked about how the when the cylinder or when the piston goes down in the cylinder to pull that uh, fuel and air mixture in, um, we talked about that. But where's the fuel and air mixture come from? Well, that's what we have a carburetor for. Most uh, most engines on light training aircraft are what we call carburetor. They have a carburetor. Some of the newer ones are fuel injected, and that's what you mostly find on cars now. It is fuel injection. It's more efficient, um, but it is a little bit more complicated. The carburetors are nice because they're easy to work on. If you you know if you ever have a problem, they're right very, there. Very easy for a mechanic it's to a lot of parts. Uh, fix it. Um, so in our carburetor here, uh, figure seven ten shows a diagram of the carburetor. So. And here, we finally get into Bernoulli's principle. This is where we really talk about that. At least I understand it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the carburetor uh, has what's called a venturi. So uh, where the air comes in uh, from the air filter, uh, it comes in in a tube here. And then in the carburetor has what's called a throat, where it narrows down. And as it narrows down, just like uh, the flow in a river speeding up if it gets or narrower. Or put your finger over the end of a garden hose. End of a garden hose, exactly. So the flow speeds up because it gets narrower and Bernoulli's principle tells us that as the, as the air moves faster the pressure will go down. So you get low pressure in the carburetor here and right at that point of low pressure that's where they squirt the fuel in. Some little jets with the little, tiny holes in it. Little jet, yep, so the fuel sprays out into that nice low pressure air and that mixes very effectively with that air because of the low pressure. Uh, and then it goes through the throttle, which is just a little valve, just a flat piece of metal that uh, when it's vertical it lets the air pass by and if we uh, turn it so it's horizontal it blocks off the, uh, the flow of the, the yeah. uh, air through the carburetor there. Now where the fuel comes in from uh, into those little jets, we have what's called a uh, float chamber, a float bowl. So this is uh, actually works pretty much like a toilet, mm -hmm. um, toilet tank. So you've got uh, liquid, in this case fuel, uh, in there, and the fuel is coming in from a fuel tank. Uh, in the chief, that would be just above the engine, uh, between the the cockpit and the engine, and that flows down into the float bowl. Now you have a little float, hence the name for the float bowl, uh, and as the fuel level rises in the float bowl that float comes up and it's connected to a little valve and when it gets high enough it shuts off the fuel flow. It's a painfully simple analog device that works wonderfully. Exactly. It works, as I say, it works just like a, a toilet bowl with the, with the float shutting off the water flow. And by doing that you can have always the same level of fuel in the float bowl which means you always have the same amount of pressure going from the float bowl into the carburetor which means that the fuel flows very evenly in a very predictable rate mm -hmm. uh, and that has to do with uh, getting the correct mixture of fueled air to burn uh, does in. this low pressure through here, does that help suck it yes. down through there? Exactly. Because it's low pressure. So exactly. So you get the... It creates a suction in there. Right. Correct? So you get the, the pressure of the fuel just sitting in the tank, creates a little bit of pressure, and then uh, as it goes out into the venturi, into that very low pressure area, as you say, it sort of sucks the fuel out into the It's almost the like a mini fuel pump. Kind of, a little bit, yeah. It's a, using that... that uh, that throat and Bernoulli's principle to sort of pump the fuel into the engine almost in a way. Um, so Bernoulli is important to flying a plane. It is. Just not the way I thought. Indeed. <laughs> um, now some engines, the in the Chief, this is about all we have, we don't have what's called a mixture control in the Chief, but most engines in airplanes have what's called a mixture control and that is just a little valve, uh, if you're looking at figure 7-10 here, uh, where the uh, the tube goes from the float bowl over to the venturi, you see this mixture needle labeled here. Mm -hmm. And you can drive that down into the outlet to, sh to restrict it or shut it off a little bit. And that will... Right, that'll... 
the more you shut it off, the less fuel is going in for a given amount of air, and you get what's called a leaner mixture. Leaner being less fuel for the same amount of air. Or if you open it up all the way, you get a richer mixture. And the reason we do this is because as we climb in altitude, the air pressure keeps on going down and going down, and if we didn't restrict the flow of fuel, that lower and lower pressure would just be sucking more and more fuel yep. Makes out it run in, too rich. Into the airstream makes it run too rich, uh, which reduces our fuel economy. Uh, it can also cause problems with fuel, the unburnt fuel gumming up the engine. Uh, you foul your plugs. Foul the plugs with, with uh, lead or carbon from the, the uh, gas being burnt. And yes, a lot of aviation fuel still does have lead. Um, that is in the process of being. Uh, changed right now. There's uh, a couple of new unleaded aviation fuels that have just come on the market, so probably within the next 10 years, I would say, I would expect lead in aviation gasoline to finally go away. But So will these motors, like the Chief have, have trouble in? Some of them may, but uh, the Chief's engine is uh, has low enough compression in the cylinders and has uh, low enough temperatures that it it can, it can already burn uh, just regular unleaded automotive gasoline. And in fact, that is uh, what we burn sometimes in that airplane, is just regular unleaded automotive so the gasoline. So mixture, the mixture thing, we don't have a mixture control, but I'm assuming there's a mixture needle on the car. There is. A mechanic sets and Correct. tunes the engine to run best at there whatever. Is. Right. The best at a certain altitude. So around here, you probably tune it to run best about 2,000 feet above sea level since that's it's kind of halfway in between where we sit start and where we let stop when we climb right, right? so we're about a, a thousand feet plus or minus uh, on the ground around here and most of the time this airplane is going to be flying around about a thousand feet above the ground so that's about two thousand feet above sea level so I would expect that the mechanic would tune the carburetor to be optimized for about that altitude and realistically when we climb we could probably go up to four or five before we start seeing any bad results from the that's, leaning that's, on the chief? That's correct. Um, the usual guidance is above 5,000 feet you want to be leaning the mixture. Um, on some engines you might want to do it sooner than that um, and even without having a mixture control the chief can fly up you know up to about 10,000 feet. It's not going to be nice to the engine though. No it's gonna it's gonna use a lot more fuel than we need to and it's going to possibly cause some problems with fouling of the spark plugs with that uh, unburnt fuel residue that I was talking about. But uh, it can, you can fly, you can have an engine run with a mixture that's too rich. Um, the problem that you get into with mixture is if it's too lean. Uh, so when the fuel air mixture goes into the cylinder in an engine, mm -hmm. um, we usually run it with more fuel than the optimum ratio to burn all of it. And the reason we do that is to help keep the engine cool. Yep. So the, the fuel that's not burned um, will actually go out through the exhaust valve, uh, still not burned, and that will actually, as it evaporates, it will help to uh, cool the exhaust pipe, which otherwise can get very hot. Uh, the uh, chief doesn't really have an exhaust gas temperature gauge, but on new airplanes that do, you'll see around 1300 degrees Fahrenheit on that uh, exhaust temperature. You don't want to be temperature. Temperature. Yeah. So that's why we uh, run a little bit of extra fuel through to kelp keep, because otherwise you might get temperatures up in the range of 1500 degrees, and that's starting to get hot enough that you can damage the metal in the engine. Yeah. So. Uh, the other thing that we can get into if we run the mixture too lean, besides the temperature getting too high, is you can have the uh, the fuel burn instantaneously, so basically explode rather than burn. Cause this knocking, right? Right. So the as the fuel burns in the engine, we want it to burn smoothly because if it doesn't, if it just all combusts at exactly the same time. We essentially get an explosion in the cylinder, and that explosion will expand very rapidly when that when that uh, essentially blast wave from the explosion hits the piston, 
it'll do it very violently, and that's ca that causes what we call knock, where um, you can actually feel that if the uh, if the engine is running much too lean, um, the sort of vibration of the engine will take on sort of a a very harsh uh, quality to it, and that's because of that. That uh, way back in the day, all my first cars knocked. Yep. You know, and, and half of them kept running when you turned the key off. Yep. And uh, from all of that same those same problems. Yep. So you want to have the mixture adjusted uh, just about right. Otherwise, you'll either get uh, fouling from the residue, or you'll get knock and other detonation knocks and, and some other problems. Um, the other thing that can cause uh, knock besides the mixture being too lean is if you're running fuel that's below the grade specified for the engine. So they talk about the octane of a fuel mm -hmm. and that's something that's often misunderstood. A lot of people think that octane has to do with how much energy the gasoline has. No, that's not actually it at all. Uh, gasoline, all gasoline has about the same amount of energy. The thing that's changing as you boost the octane level up is the amount of uh, cooling that, that fuel can provide. So as that fuel uh, burns or, or as the unburnt fuel evaporates in the engine, how much is it helping to keep the engine cool? And the higher the octane, the more it will help to keep the engine cool. So if you run a lower uh, octane fuel than uh, specified for the engine, uh, the engine will run too hot and the fuel will burn too quickly and you'll get things like knock, uh, you'll get uh, things like, uh, so knock is also sometimes called detonation, where you have an explosion rather than a, a smooth burning. You can also get what's called pre-ignition, where you get the cylinder head gets so hot that as it, it ignites before it, it gets ignites to the top. before the spark plug even fires. And that's bad because then if, it, if the fuel starts to burn too soon, the engine will try to run, or that cylinder will try to run backwards. And if one, It's not good on a crankshaft. Yeah, no, if one is trying to run backwards and the other three are trying to run forwards... Uh, it's a lot of stress in the things, wrong places. Things bend where they shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so another thing to realize about a carburetor, uh, we talked about how in this throat, uh, Bernoulli's principle tells us that the pressure of the air will go down. Well, another thing to talk about besides Bernoulli's principle is called the ideal gas law. And uh, you can look up the formula for that if you'd like to, but the, uh, what it essentially says is as the pressure goes down, the temperature also goes down. And that's just because as the, as the gas, in this case air, uh, is, gets to a lower pressure, the molecules are further apart, they don't hit each other as much, so the temperature goes down. Um, so the temperature of the air as it goes to the carburetor goes down. It can sometimes go down by quite a significant amount. It's what, 50, 60 degrees? Yeah. So, so we could be it, flying on a 70 degree day and it could be 20 degrees inside. 20 that degrees injury. inside the carburetor, yes. So the, and adding to that also is when the fuel evaporates, that also that cools, cools, too. It, cools it down. And so what can happen is, particularly if the air is very humid, you have a lot of water in the air, as that air flows through the carburetor, all that uh, air gets much colder, it can go below freezing, and all that water vapor in the air can flash freeze and actually stick to the sides of the carburetor throat. So here in figure 7-11, uh, you can see how uh, you've got your nozzle here that sprays the fuel in and then just after that uh, where the pressure of the air is low and where the fuel is evaporating uh, that'll drop the temperature enough that the water vapor in the air will freeze onto the sides of the carburetor and also onto the throttle valve and when it does that it's the throat just starts getting smaller and smaller and at a certain point it can't let enough air through anymore to let the engine breathe so that can actually cause the engine to initially run rough and potentially fail if enough ice builds up. So the way we get around that is we have carburetor heat. So the, in, the air inlet uh, 
can take air from inside the engine compartment, run it over the exhaust pipe to heat it up, and then into the carburetor. So if, you're, if you've got air that's say, let's say the air coming in is 50 degrees, and the, uh, the temperature drops by, let's say, uh, 30 degrees, so now your, your air temperature inside the carburetor is uh, 20, and that causes the water vapor to freeze. Um, if you put carburetor heat on, well, that air coming over the exhaust pipe gets heated up to maybe 120, 130 it won't degrees, take long to fix it. and it melts the ice and opens the, car the throat of the carburetor back up so the engine can breathe again. So if we're and the Continental engines, like we have on the Chief, are particularly susceptible to this um, because the way Continental built their engines, the the um, oil tank is just a separate tank below the engine. And the way Lycoming that builds uh, most engines on small airplanes are either Continental or Lycoming. Those are the two mm -hmm. primary companies that build the engines. The way Lycoming designed their engine, they had the oil tank with a hole in the middle where the air comes up through it. And so you always have some amount of carburetor heat on even when... Because the oil's heated up. The oil is heated up, so the air passing through the oil tank gets heated up. So it's already somewhat warm, so the Lycomings are much less susceptible to that. The Continentals just come up through a tube that's separate, and so the air is much cooler, and that can cause carburetor icing sooner than it would ha happen in a Lycoming. The Lycoming also has the carburetor heating system to pass air over the exhaust pipe, like I talked about, but since it starts with a little bit of heat to begin with, it doesn't need as much to fix the problem. Right. So here in figure uh, 7-12, we have a chart that shows you the uh, outside air temperature from 20 degrees Fahrenheit up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity of the air, so from 50% up to 100%. And it's showing you that the place where carburetor icing is most likely to happen is if you're above 80% humidity and below a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So that spring. whole area, yeah, spring and fall essentially. Well, fall not so much because it tends to be drier around here, but as you say, spring. Even into summer because it's very humid during yep. the summer a lot of times. So from you know April, May, June into July, um, get to August, maybe it's getting a little bit warm for that, but uh, you're gonna get um, the most chance of carburetor icing at that point. Um, you can also have fuel injected engines, which is obviously what you find in most cars these days. Um, they talk a little bit about that here in uh, figure 7-13. Uh, you have, uh, in this case, you'll have a fuel pump, uh, which will just deliver pressurized fuel directly to a uh, fuel manifold that will distribute it through little it lines sprays or little pipes will sprays mist down sprays of a, a little mist of fuel directly into the cylinder this is much more efficient um, you get, can get much finer control over how much fuel goes in because rather than just having that low pressure sucking the fuel out you actually have a, a mechanical pump and and valves which can very precisely control how much fuel goes in but, uh, and nowadays with the computers, they're sensing outside temperatures and humidities and exactly, pressures and, exactly. and, that and metering it to be yep. just perfect. So you'll find in car engines and in some of the very newest airplane engines, you'll find all that computer-controlled valves and stuff and pumps to get, as you say, get exactly the right amount of fuel and get the most efficiency. Um, but in the Chief, which was designed in, you know, the engine in the Chief was designed in 1934. 1937. Same um, engine, huh? Wow. Yep. And uh, that's the thing is up until uh, about 10 years ago, engine design hadn't really changed since about 1950 for airplanes. Um, most of the uh, Cessnas and Pipers that are running around are uh, running engines that were designed in the early 1950s. And they're not retrofitting them with fuel injection. Uh, some of them have, you know, the, the newer ones have been retrofitted with fuel injection, but it's still the same basic engine. Yeah. Um, another thing here they talk about is you can have uh, uh, supercharged or turbocharged engines in airplanes just like you can in cars. 
um, gives you a boost in power. Uh, this is something you probably won't encounter unless you go into commercial pilot trainer. You fly a very fast uh, airplane. Basically, it's taking the air coming in, whatever pressure, as you go higher, the pressure is lower. Yep. The supercharger runs off the engine, yep. the, the motor of it, and it yep. compresses it's that like air. Basically, a little compressor it, on the back of the end. Right, before it goes into yep. the fuel mixture. And then the turbocharger runs off of heat exhaust, so it's a little more efficient. Yep. But it gets your oil a lot hotter. Yeah. I've read a whole lot about those because I used to be a little bit of a car nut. Oh, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I get how and those work, and I remember reading all about the Spitfires and the P-51. Yep. Couldn't keep up with the Spitfire because their first version didn't have a supercharger. Yep, exactly. You know, about about 5,000 feet, it was useless. Exactly. And, that, and you bring up a good point there, which is in cars, the uh, supercharger or turbocharger is just used to pack more air into the engine and get more power out of it. In airplanes, you can use it for that, but you can also use it to keep... The, uh, the air pressure coming into the engine higher as you go up in altitude. So as you go right. up, the air pressure goes down, you get less air, you can make less power, but the turbocharger you and the supercharger... You put it back to the 2,000 foot level and, right. and your engine keeps running right up to 10 or 15,000. You know, you'll find that in Warbirds, you'll find that in some very high performance airplanes like some of the Moonies or Cirruses these days, um, but that is getting into airplanes that uh, we're not likely to fly. And uh, if you do fly those airplanes, you're typically going to be getting a uh, high performance endorsement. Yeah, there's um, a lot of training that goes along with it. And you would, you would study that considerably more, getting that endorsement to operate those kinds of airplanes. So for now, I think we'll move on to uh, other uh, aspects of the engine. Uh, so we've talked about the four uh, cycles or four strokes of the engine. We've talked about how the fuel gets into the engine. Um, and we've talked about how the spark plug ignites it, but how does the spark plug get power? So in, in a car, uh, you'll find that just the battery will run those spark plugs through a distributor or something like that. In an airplane, um, because we can potentially have a battery go uh, dead on us and we don't want the engine to quit if that happens, we still run magnetos, which are basically little... Uh, generators or dynamos that are run directly off the engine, which means as long as the engine is spinning, it'll be creating those little electrical charges to fire the spark plug. So basically, once the engine's running, it'll just keep running until you shut off the fuel or shut off the ignition, one of the two. Um, and that's why in the Chief, uh, the Chief doesn't have a battery even. Right. Uh, there's no electrical system except for uh, the magnetos uh, those little dynamos I talked about creating the electrical charge to fire the spark plugs and that's why uh, you might have seen in the first flight that we did together uh, when we started the airplane I just pulled on the propeller there's a whole technique to that we'll go into uh, in more detail as we continue through the flights but I just pulled on the propeller spun the engine by hand and that was enough to spin these little dynamos create a spark and fire the engine off and get it running um, and old cars like Model T's and Model yep, A's and stuff like that, you have the hand crank, that's the same exact thing. Those old cars had magnetos uh, because those were very reliable. Uh, a battery can go dead or lose charge. A magneto, it, as long as it's... It's a simple set, old analog technology that just works. It just works. Uh, and There's not much to it to break other than a ground wire coming off. And if a ground wire comes off, the only problem then is you can't shut it off. Or if it's sitting still and it comes right. off, it can be ugly when you try eh, to stop. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, See, I did read all that. Yep, very much. <laughs> um, so uh, we talked about that. Uh, we also have, uh, obviously, you have to lubricate the engine. So you have all these parts uh, spinning around very fast. Uh, if you have metal on metal, uh, moving that quickly, it would tend to just wear itself down to nothing. So we use oil to uh, lubricate it, get a little film of oil between all the moving parts of the engine so it doesn't wear down. And in order to deliver oil to all the parts of the engine that are moving, uh, we have an oil pump and usually we have an oil tank down at the bottom of the engine. And most engines are what they call wet sump, where all the oil drains down into the tank and then gets pumped back up into the engine again. A lot of cars have gone to what they call a dry sump, which uh, can use less oil 
which is an advantage, but also uh, is more susceptible to an oil pump that may fail. Uh, so again, in airplanes, uh, they've typically stayed with the wet sump because uh, in airplanes, just like the magnetos, we prefer things that just work, even if it's older technology. Um, so that's the oil system of an engine. Uh, you show on figure 7-17 a little bit about how that pump uh, pumps the oil up into the engine to lubricate things like the crankshaft, the, uh, the pistons yeah. and rings. Uh, to some extent, although you don't want too much oil going no, in the cylinders, um, but you also lubricate things like the valves, all the things that in the engine that move. Um, a little bit about the oil system in an engine. And the oil also helps to cool the engine because as all that oil runs through all those moving parts of the engine, well, that's where most of the heat is coming from, is all those parts moving against each other. So the oil picks up that heat, and then when it goes back down into the tank, it uh, deposits all that heat down there, which can then radiate away. And some engines also have an oil cooler, basically a little radiator yep. that the oil will run through, and that helps keep the temperature of the engine down. Um, most engines in airplanes are air-cooled, so um, besides the oil, then uh, we just have air that passes over the cylinders, and the cylinders have little, uh, little f cooling fins or little protrusions on them to uh, catch the air and help it take the heat away from heat the cylinders. Heat sinks. Heat sinks, exactly. Um, and this is, again, very much like a, an older VW engine. And that's part of the reason why they're used in home-built airplanes is because they're air-cooled engines, so they are already... They're easy to work on and they run. They're easy to work on, they run, and they're already pretty much set up the way this uh, airplane engine would be anyway. So on home-built aircraft, those are used uh, quite extensively. Still today, huh? Yep. And actually, uh, the only companies that I know of that still uh, produce... Uh, VW engines and sell them in this country are either uh, home-built aircraft supply companies or uh, auto racing companies because those are the only two sort of communities of people that still use those engines. Uh, you also have, we talked about how the uh, magnetos create the spark, the electrical charge to run the spark for the engine, but we also have electrical systems in airplanes for other things. The Chief obviously doesn't, but in most of the, of the Cessnas and Pipers that you'd find as trainers, uh, we have an electric starting motor, so we don't have to hand prop the airplane like the Chief. Uh, that requires a battery and a starter switch and all those things that go along with it. Um, and since we have a battery, we have to have an alternator or a generator that charges it. And since we have all those things anyway, people figured, well, why don't we just run some radios and some lights off that? So. Sure. Uh, most airplanes will have an entire electrical system uh, consisting of the generator or alternator, which is hooked onto the back of the engine to create electrical current. That goes into the battery, and the battery will run things like radios, the starter motor, uh, lights, all the electrical. And there are some airplanes it runs the, the wing flaps or the landing gear if it has a retractable landing gear. Um, all those things will run off the airplane's electrical system. Of course, obviously in the Chief that's something we don't have, but uh, if we do some uh, night flying, for if we end up going for the private pilot certificate, uh, we'll have to deal with some of that because if to fly at night, obviously we need lights. Yeah. So we'll have to have an airplane that at least has a battery, if not a generator or alternator, uh, to be able to run those lights. Um, they get into, on page 720, 721 here, talking a little bit about turbine engines, jet engines, turboprop engines, all very interesting but not very relevant to yeah, uh, not typical <coughs> private pilot training. Um, talked uh, a little bit about the fuel uh, system, but also um, in... Uh, in airplanes, we typically have either uh, two kinds of fuel systems, either a gravity feed, so that's where the, f the fuel just flows downhill high wings. through the force of gravity, high wing airplanes, or like the Chief just have, has a uh, fuel tank 
that's just almost directly above the engine so the fuel can just flow directly down into the carburetor or like in Cessnas uh, you would have as you say fuel tanks in the wings so that the fuel can just flow down into the fuselage and into the carburetor very simple it just works but uh, if you want to build a low wing airplane like the Pipers or uh, Cirruses, various different airplanes that are popular these days um, you have you still have the fuel tanks in the wings, but now they're down below the engine, so you have to have a fuel pump to force the fuel up into the engine, into either a fuel injector or a carburetor, in order to uh, have the engine run. And those airplanes usually have a uh, fuel pump that's just gear driven directly off the engine, and if that fails, they also have an electric backup that can run off the battery to provide fuel to the engine. Um, They have more information on aircraft electrical systems here on page 7-31. They get into considerably more detail about how they set up the electrical systems with different buses. A bus is just a big bar of metal. Power distribution. How this <coughs> distributes electrical power to various different pieces of equipment. And you have circuit breakers, obviously, to protect against where all your fuses short are circuits or over voltage, things like that. Um, so a lot more information on that on page 731 here, 732. Um, we'll talk about that uh, somewhat, but obviously since the chief doesn't have an electrical system, we're not yeah. going to get into that too much in the course of our training, at least until we potentially do some night flying in a different airplane. Uh, you will have to, uh, obviously, to pass the private pilot knowledge test, which if this is partially to... Uh, prepare you for that. Mm -hmm. There will be some questions about that. but uh, I've worked on cars enough in my early days that I, yeah, I understand how the fuses and the distribution systems. And yeah, and it, you know, it's not that different. If you know how to work on a 1930 Chevy, you can probably find your way around an airplane pretty well. At least an old chief, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, something else that uh, we will not encounter in our flying, but it definitely will come up on the test, so we'll have to talk about it here as oxygen. So, uh, <coughs> oxygen for the pilots and the passengers. So as we fly higher and higher in altitude, obviously the air gets thinner, uh, which means there's less air for us to breathe, as well as less air for the engine to use and less air over the wings. Uh, but as we uh, climb higher in altitude, we have less and less air to breathe, and you can get uh, into a condition called hypoxia where you have uh, not enough air essentially to sustain you and you can it uh, has effects that are it varies in different people some people get you know nausea sick to the stomach other people find it to be like being drunk um, you can get various problems but to get around that uh, Any time that we're at high altitude, we want to make sure that we have oxygen supplied. So there's a couple different ways to do that. One is larger airplanes like airliners or uh, large business aircraft will have pressurized cabins where they take a uh, essentially very much like a, a uh, supercharger, except instead of hooking it up to the engine, they hook it up to the cabin. So you're essentially supercharging your yep. cabin Get where the, the people are down. sitting. Keep that pressure, keep that air pressure up so that you can breathe, just like you would if you're sitting on the ground. So that's one way to provide air. Um, but if that pressurization fails, or in airplanes that are small enough, that pressurization is not practical. Uh, we have oxygen that's which is usually stored in like a bottle or an oxygen tank, almost like a scuba tank, but uh, they're slightly different for aviation use. Uh, which would be delivered to a mask or a, a <coughs> nasal cannula right. uh, to deliver oxygen to you so you can breathe effectively up to higher altitudes. So, um, Generally it's about 10,000 feet when you have to start worrying about that? Thereabouts, yes. The guidance uh, for pressurized airplanes, if the pressurization fails, is you want to get down below 10,000 feet. Right. Now, as far as regulation, and this is what will be on the test, uh, there's a few numbers to remember. So uh, if you climb higher than 12,500 feet and you stay there for more than 30 minutes, then you'll need oxygen for the pilot. Okay, uh, And that one's kind of hard to remember, but uh, 
uh, the reasoning behind that is they've determined that above that altitude, if you're above that for long enough, you'll start to, the oxygen levels in your blood will start going down, you'll start being, you know, impaired judgment or uh, decreased color vision, a number of different symptoms you can get from that. So uh, once you climb above 12,500 feet, uh, if you're up there for more than 30 minutes, you need to have oxygen, okay? Um, now, of course, the chief, we're not going to get much above 10,000 anyway, but you will need to know this for the test. The next altitude to remember is 14,000 feet. Above 14,000 feet, uh, if you're above that altitude for any length of time, the pilots need to be on oxygen, okay? Uh, so 12,500 feet and above, uh, if you're there for more than 30 minutes, you need oxygen, but when you get up to 14,000, if you're above 14,000 at all, pilots need oxygen. Next altitude and final altitude to remember is 15,000 feet. Above 15,000 feet, passengers must be provided with oxygen. It's interesting to note that the regulation says provided with, does not say use. <laughs> they are free to pass out if they so choose. <laughs> Might help them if they're afraid to fly. <laughs> Let's just go to 15,000. But, uh, so those are the, the big numbers to remember. They do have a chart here in figure 7-41 showing uh, how the pressure decreases with altitude, a few things about that. Uh, talk considerably about different oxygen systems here, page 736 to 737. Um, and they talk about different masks that you can wear to get oxygen. So the simplest type that I talked about was the nasal cannula. That's just a little tube that comes, you know, hooks around your ears, comes and just sort of squirts it up into your nose so that you can have more oxygen to breathe. Uh, the next type that you'll get into is uh, what they call a, a, a diluter demand, which is basically just, it uh, will have the, uh, the mask, will, uh, you'll breathe in and out normally through it, and the mask will just add more and more oxygen to that uh, breathing in and out as you go up in altitude to keep the amount of oxygen yeah. roughly the same and then finally you get what's called a pressure demand type where that's basically like a scuba mask and uh, you need those if you're going to fly way up high but uh, typically in small aircraft uh, you'll either just stay below 12,500 feet or uh, you'll use maybe a nasal cannula and the nasal cannulas are good up to about 18,000 feet which is as high as you can fly with that out without an instrument rating anyway so those are sufficient for most of the use in small airplanes um, but there will be a few questions on the test about that so it's important to at least know some of the broad categories of uh, how the oxygen systems work uh, they talk here about uh, de-icing and anti-icing systems. Uh, this is if you're flying in clouds in the winter time, ice will tend to accumulate on the airplane. Um, large airplanes and airliners have systems to either prevent it from forming or to remove it once it does form. But in small airplanes, uh, that's typically not practical. So we just stay out of conditions that would cause icing. We'll talk a lot more you're about not that. Send me out wing walking with an ice pick. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little worried about that. Uh, there is a, a funny story about that uh, back when they were flying DC-3s, you know, the big mm -hmm. uh, uh, piston engine airliners. Um, those had anti-icing on the wings and the propellers, but they didn't have much on the windshield. And uh, um. the story an old, uh, old airline pilot was telling uh, was about uh, how they would remove ice from the windshield in the DC-3. He said they, uh, the side window would open they had a little scraper. They would reach Just out. Like in your car. They would reach out around the front and <laughs> scrape the windshield. <laughs> and that, you know, back in the 1930s, that's the way they just got by with that. Uh, nowadays, if you, uh, if you, uh, well, it wasn't pressurized, gonna, so no. If you're going to fly uh, in icing conditions, you have a lot more systems nowadays on modern airplanes. But uh, in the we won't of, be going there. We won't be going there, and uh, obviously the chief doesn't have any of that, and even most of the Cessnas and Pipers that you'd be flying as a private pilot would not have that. Um, 
And that concludes our uh, section on aircraft, aircraft systems. systems. Sweet. Uh, so any uh, reflections or uh, questions on No real on questions this? on that because a lot of it was very similar to car mechanics. And my dad very raised much. me to work on my own car. Exactly. Asked me to do it now, not going to happen. <laughs> but I understood the four stroke, I understood the supercharger and turbocharger. Yeah. Those all make a lot of sense. Some yep. of the, the pressurized systems and stuff like that, I knew enough about those already to be dangerous, but I know I'm not going to encounter that with this level of training that right. I'm doing. Right. But having flown all over when I was a kid, I'm familiar with a lot right. of the oxygen stuff right. from the and, mask and the Right, and obviously if you fly on an airliner, uh, the flight attendants will brief you on use of oxygen What kind masks. of mask are those that pop drop down? Those are essentially uh, basically a cannula except just with a little, you know, a little. little cover on it. Um, and those are interesting because in airliners, uh, since they're designed only for single use, just enough to get you down to the ground, um, they don't actually use an oxygen tank anymore. They use uh, a little canister that has two chemicals and off the top of my head I couldn't tell you what How ones are. How long does that last for? Last, depending on what kind of airplane it is, uh, the higher the airplane flies the longer they have to last for, but usually they last for about 15 minutes mm -hmm. and that's enough to well, get Well some down. of them still have oxygen tanks because a few years back <clears throat> I was coming home from a trip and we were flying from Fort Lauderdale to Minneapolis or mm -hmm. something we had a medical emergency on the plane. Yeah. <clears throat> a lady went into, con it was oh yeah, it was scary. Well, they, but they, when we landed, we landed in Milwaukee, yep. and I had to go all the way to Minnesota to come back to Madison. I should have just rented a car. Yep. But <clears throat> we landed in Milwaukee. They had given this lady oxygen from a yep. tank. Yep. And so we couldn't go back in the air until they got an oxygen tank, but they weren't yep. a hub, so they had to wait for a third party. And yep. 45 minutes later, we finally... Yep. So, yeah, they, so there they, are still oxygen tanks on, they, the, they, on the plane. They carry one or two... Uh, for that kind of stuff. Portable ones for medical <clears throat> conditions. Well, those those um, Delta folks really used it, but, and they, uh, they were amazing. So my big question, have you yeah. ever had to, have you ever had the things drop when you were on a flight? I have not. Have you ever had to breathe oxygen while you were flying? Uh, once or twice, <clears throat> but only because there are regulations where above a certain altitude um, you have to be on oxygen even if the airplane is pressurized. So I've had to put an oxygen mask on if I'm flying above those altitudes. Jeez, what did you do, go in a U-2 or something? In a jet. Uh, airliners can even get up to those kind of altitudes where the where the pilots are required to be on oxygen, even if the airplane is still Some of those big pressure. international ones? Uh, even the smaller regional jets can get, can get up that high if you, if you really want to. We don't go up that high very often. So um, you have an oxygen set up in your cockpit in case you have to fly over a thunderhead or something? Uh, that's correct, <clears throat> yes. So you can go up to 40, 45 or something, throw the mask on, and in the cabin air will be fine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and the reason that we're that airline pilots are required to wear it, even if the airplane's pressurized, if you're over a certain altitude, is not because there isn't enough air to breathe in the cabin. It's just that if the cabin were to depressurize, you wouldn't have time to put it on. Yeah, they need to be ready to go. Yep.